Okay, everyone. <clears throat> I see that everyone's got a little bit of food on their plate, and we are going to start the keynote session. Um, I would like to thank uh, ETOM for helping to support the, a live stream of this event. Um, uh, so uh, please, uh, if you see some ETOM folks around, thank them um, for, uh, for their support for this session. Um, I would like to introduce Pat Bevilacqua, Regional Sales Manager for Blackboard. Thank you, Eric. All right, let's see where I stand here. I'll only be here for 30 seconds, so don't worry. Uh, you're here to see Gordon Friedman. Uh, again, Pat Bevelock with Blackboard. Uh, we really appreciate everyone uh, being here and allowing us to be able to present. I think you'll uh, really enjoy this session. Uh, from the short period of time that I've uh, been able to speak with Gordon, uh, I've been am amazed by his uh, amount of experience in education in general and a lot of higher ed specific background, but uh, I know all of you Michiganders like me will be happy that he is a MSU Spartan grad and <laughs> a former resident of Charlevoix. Uh, just a little bit about Gordon. Gordon is our Vice President of Education Strategy. I'll let Gordon go into his background and tell you a little bit about how long he's been with Blackboard and what he brings for all of you. Some of the things I do want to let you know is if you're familiar with Prometheus, uh, that Blackboard acquired in the past. Gordon worked for that organization, has a huge foundation in working with higher education, uh, publishers. Uh, he had a consulting company of his own and has done a lot of work there as well with educators, uh, whether at a K-12 level, a secondary, post-secondary, and even at uh, state and Department of Education levels. Uh, Gordon studies the industry. He consults with many companies and partners about course management and other things that impact an institution well beyond course management. And at Blackboard, he's told me that he's the advocate for you within Blackboard. He wants to understand your needs that go well beyond what Blackboard does and what your campus needs are. And he wants to convey that to management so that we can continue to innovate and offer more value to you. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, you speak with Gordon Friedman. Thank you, Pat. Well, you don't need that, do you? I'll get rid of that. Okay, can people hear me in the back? Okay, good. All right, so I live in California now. I grew up in Charlevoix and just couldn't afford to live in Traverse City or Charlevoix anymore. <laughs> and, um, but I'm happy to be back here for a particular reason. Um, politics in our state is a little bit crazy right now. <laughs> so you've got the Terminator as the governor, and I don't know if you've heard this or not, Warren Beatty has been shadowing him um, and going around to different places where, where he's been speaking and not getting in. So you've got um, you know, the person who did hairspray up against the person who did the Terminator. <laughs> okay, and that's not the end of it. Um, you know, it looks like Rob Reiner is getting ready to enter the race and possibly run. So you've got Meathead um, <laughs> going against hairspray and the Terminator. So it's just very good to be back somewhere where things are a little more sensible. Anyway, um, I'm at Blackboard now. I've been here for all of three and a half, four months, and, but I'm not, um, I'm not new to the industry. I've been involved with course management uh, since it got going. This thing works. So when Pat said I was an advocate on the inside, I started bothering Matthew Patinsky about six, eight months ago and said, Matthew, what are you gonna do with all this money that you raised by going public? Um, I'm a consultant, you know, give me a little extra work. And little did I know what they were planning to do with that money, but um, I came aboard and part of it was really to, to bring the experience of what education needs now, but really where education is going. And today I wanna talk about a little bit about my view on that. Um, I've had some background with universities. The underscored ones are ones that employed me. The others are places where I consulted. So <coughs> Rochester Institute of Technology, I helped them with their online distance program. I helped Michigan State start their MSU Global program. And then Cal State Monterey Bay, if anybody in here has ever been at a startup university, raise your hand. Um, and there are not many hands up. It is a very strange and interesting experience. So if, if, you've, if you've been at one, you know. So um, the Cal State system with 23 schools started uh, uh, a university on an army base, uh, quite an experience. Uh, Case Western have done some work for both the University of California and um, uh, two of the campuses, and then Capella up in um, uh, Minnesota. 
uh, one of the proprietaries. And then at George Washington U, I'll explain you know, what happened there. So I've become somewhat of a student of the industry or I can't keep a job very long. It's, it's, you know, that's my excuse. Um, at Prometheus, for those of you who knew it, it was a product that grew out of George Washington U. And it was a neat product. We had a model that would work for about 100 campuses and then we couldn't cross the chasm. I mean, you really need to be large to do this job well and to maintain your code base. But it was an interesting experience. Um, I've consulted both for eCollege and WebCT. So I, I kind of know them and how they operate. Tech-centric, which is up here, and something I'll address today too, I became really interested in the textbook industry. I mean, we've emulated the classroom. They've sort of emulated the textbook, but I think there's something wrong with that picture. There must be something that comes where the two things go together and five years from now, you wouldn't be able to say which is what. Um, so that's of interest. Um, the other companies, O'Reilly, um, if you don't know them, very interesting. The, um, this is the, the tech book company. They have a wonderful new portal called Safari U. Um, and they've set it up where you can mix and match your content with their chapter content from many different publishers. We will eventually work with companies like that to bring that information into our system. Um, Addie Pond's a journal company. And then the University of California College Prep is our, in California, our virtual school. But what's nice about it is the University of California creates, get this, I mean, 800 to a million dollar, 800,000 to a million dollar courses, beautiful multimedia, uh, and then those are available to our students who need AP and honors courses um, throughout the state. Uh, California teachers work with those students, and then juniors and seniors in the University of California in subject area are tutors. So for $25 a semester, even if you're not enrolled, you can get a chemistry tutor who's maybe five years older than you. And it's part of that cycle of putting these two things together. Um, and then, of course, Blackboard. So the things that I look at is I try to read what we're doing in e-learning and say, what does it all mean? Where is it going? Where is it going? And ultimately, and look at policy issues. Um, any of us who work in a company like Blackboard or WebCT or a publisher, we're really taking in public dollars. And I don't think people stop and think about that. But the money comes from taxpayers. And so using that appropriately, being able to help um, guide where education policy is going uh, is something that I'm interested in and we're interested in. Performance and efficiency, I think those are two of the big, big issues. I look at those across the system. Transformation, um, when will we get to a point where we don't talk about this as being something special, but just something we do? Um, and then success at, at every level. So we are talking about Blackboard 2.0, or it could be e-learning 2.0. Where are we going? And essentially, I think two or three things happened in the last year or two. Um, web services occurred, XML occurred, and the standards where this became no longer black box activity. We, we know what to do. Uh, a lot of us in this room know what to do. Maybe the people we work for don't, don't know from time to time. But we've gotten to a point to talk about where we're going. So um, I don't know if, um, if you knew this mission. This was the mission statement for Blackboard up until what, Adrian, a month or two ago? OK, so to transform the internet into a powerful environment for education experience. Um, that's like so 90s, right? It doesn't even, um, <laughs> doesn't even compute. So our marketing people got to work and we have a new mission statement and we think it's simple, we think it, it to the point to enable educational innovations everywhere by connecting people and technology. And when we mean, when we say everywhere, we mean it. Now I don't know if this is Matt Gibby's head or not, but it, is it Adrian? Okay, all right, it's Todd Gibby, it's somebody that, um, that we know and then by everywhere, you know, we're really talking about, you know, could this ever happen? Could you ever put the billboard up there and, and have that experience? Um, the company is invested heavily in where we're going in terms of collaboration, um, in going from the e-learning experience into the group experience and expanding collaboration. Um, innovation, you heard about Caliper a little bit this morning. Um, uh, is a very important product for us, and it will begin to begin to address the question of how do we know this is working? What are we learning from it as an institution, uh, as individual courses? So 
caliper is important to us. Uh, with the backpack, uh, another innovation where we're taking uh, and making what you do uh, online mobile so it can be disconnected. These, we think, are important pieces of the puzzle and we'll keep working on them. Um, where is it all going? And, I, and this is, again, maybe more of an overview uh, perspective, but the things that we do now you know, are all familiar to us. And I think as we get down to learning objects and content repositories and e-portfolios, those are things we're grappling with now. I was with a group of CIOs recently and they said, where are we gonna put this stuff for the next 50 years? And I don't know if anybody in this room has an answer to that question, but it's a great question. On e-portfolios, something that we're working on, how do we make that e-portfolio be permanent? Does it ever become something that the student uh, owns at some level? So there, and will that become systematized? Uh, so there are questions like that. Learning objects I think we're all grappling with. Our content system was a, a reaction to that and I think a good one. So what's next? Some of these things don't even look like e-learning, but from the institution's point of view, they're pretty important. Security is huge. It's the, every survey at the CIO level, it's the most important thing. Uh, if the system goes down, if somebody hacks it, um, I heard a terrible story out of Tulane in, uh, in New Orleans, and that was that they luckily backed up everything on tape, and I don't know if you've heard this story. And so they felt, rest, you know, they were resting assured that they had the whole campus infrastructure, their Blackboard instance taken care of. The authorities would not let them back in after the flooding started to rescue the tapes. So, you know, in one fell swoop, it was all gone. So we, those are things that are very, very important. Compliance, I don't know if anybody here has heard what happened to the president of American University who had a little extra spending. Um, we're in a Sarbanes-Oxley world where not only the um, corporate CEOs are being watched very carefully, but, but institutional uh, hierarchies are as well. So uh, that's an issue. And these things don't look like e-learning, but in a way they've grown from the e-learning world to the e-world that we exist in. Um, I-portfolios, the assessment um, uh, capabilities to have an institutional portfolio that the accreditation agencies can look for. I don't know about here um, in middle states, but in California, our creditors want to see a continual record of what's going on. So they're requiring the management and administration of universities to keep something like that, um, and so, that's gonna be a growing area you'll hear something about. Full infrastructures, I just mean as we, uh, as the administrative side of software and the academic side go further down the road, uh, what are these structures gonna look like? Um, could it be possible that a state will have its own infrastructure? Um, I can see in K-12, for example, where you could put the state's curriculum up online and then do everything from just use it to do some homework with all the way to the other end where you might have a full online learning program like, um, like Michigan Virtual here. Uh, policy K-20, um, there, there are pockets of it, uh, usually generally right outside the university. You'll see some action between campus and schools, but again, in an e-world, um, we're having so much trouble with remediating kids, which I assume that you go through here, you get the students in for math and for English, um, do we prepare them ahead of time? Do we say if you want to go to one of our universities, we, want, we don't want your diploma, we want to know that you can test into this area and you're not going to pull down faculty time doing something that your high school should have done for you. So that's a policy issue, it's a K-20 issue. Um, is it our issue in this room? Maybe yes, maybe no. I think these things generally have larger meaning. Um, also, you know, for the last, years since e-learning got going, we, you know, we got away with what we could, told the administrations what we had to, to get the budgets we needed to do what we needed to do. Um, now I think there's gonna be a much greater uh, interchange as uh, administrations come to realize, and it'll, it'll take a while, what the reliance is on e-learning. Um, one of the things that I wanna do in my work at Blackboard is get out, see provosts, see presidents, see trustees, and talk to them a, about where education's going, but also come back and say to them, do you know if we pulled the plug on Blackboard for 20 minutes, what would happen on your campus? Uh, maybe we put them up to it that we will pull, pull the plug, you know, until they look into how it actually operates and what it actually means and what it means to a student or faculty member. 
So, and then on the positive side of that, to have encouraged them to understand why we need to grow um, uh, faculty development and why we need to, to grow faculty involvement in using these tools. So those are pieces that are important. Um, there are other things that are going on. Uh, content management on the campus is gonna be another big issue. And by that I mean not just the content we use for teaching and learning, but if you're at a giant university, um, your web presence is now generally handled by a couple macho people and then hundreds of others that touch that web presence. There will be products and services that will organize that better and the compliance world is gonna require that uh, as time goes on. Um, so from my point of view, this is the objective is knowledge. It's passing knowledge you know, from faculty to students, students growing it themselves, how, however it is, and returning uh, intellectual capital back into society. So we've used technology and course development as a means to do that, and that's the stage we're really in, and for us, essentially, who've been pioneering this, it's very important. The next stage up is clearly, um, we're not gonna escape No Child Left Behind at the higher ed level, um, and I heard a, a very good speech, I think it's on the web, from the chancellor of the University of Texas system who said, look, if we don't figure this out on our own, somebody's gonna visit it on us and we should get ahead of the game. So part of why uh, we're looking at Caliper is to get in front of those issues uh, before they become um, mandatory. Um, and then finally, I think I've been talking about these larger issues. And I'm just gonna go through a couple pieces here um, of where I see some things going. I see e-learning is truly being um, the bellwether, if you will, of educational transformation. I don't think there's any question about it. Um, we, you know, that went back to the old question that we were all confronted with was, well, how do you know this is good as, as good as what happens in the classroom? Well, tell me, Mr. President, what goes on in the classroom? How do you know what goes on in the classroom? At least here we have a record, we have interactions. As we develop products like Caliper, we'll have statistics. So it's an important question. Um, I'm looking at what you know yesterday, today, and tomorrow might look like. So right now, we're in a cycle where the software is maturing, as we've talked about. Um, it's getting more standardized. It's not so much a black box. So the next question up then is what, are, what institutional objectives are being handled? And as, as, as the troops in the foreground go out and do what they're doing, you know, are the generals in the back room supporting that? And if so, to what ends? Um, and then the question is organizational issues. If I had my wish at Blackboard, I would have half the company not devoted to technology but to sociology of humans working together. Because I think in an in a odd sort of way, technology, when it works well, points out you know, how bad we are at working with each other. So it's, um, and I'll, I'll even drill into this a little bit. So moving from the technical to the human. So the leadership, you all know when you have good leadership around technology and e-learning, it makes a big difference. And you can maybe accomplish that in one, uh, in one institution. What happens between institutions? It's all state dollars here. So at least, I don't know what goes on in this building, but I've seen two board trustees' pictures out in the hallway. There's some cooperation. How far that goes, whether it crosses over into e-learning or not, I don't know. Um, and then in terms of across levels of institution, you could execute policy, um, algebra, is a great example. It's the worst you know, nightmare in the country uh, in terms of getting kids to do it, to get out of high school and do it to get into, um, uh, into college. Could you have an algebra policy uh, that, that had an e-learning uh, component to it? Certainly. So it's that kind of thinking at that next level that's gonna be important. We had a very good um, cross-state meeting in North Carolina uh, about 10 days ago and the CIO at the University of North Carolina organized the community college system, uh, the, the NC State system, the workforce development people, and their K-12 people, and they brought in legislators, they brought in uh, state school board members, and I think it was one of the first times that there's been a group like this that was focused on these issues, and again, the importance of it was not so much what we did, we brought in panels of people to talk about successful case studies of what they were doing in their states, but it was really important because those officials all got to talk to each other uh, and they had a common experience. 
um, the University of Cincinnati uh, hosts Blackboard from their system for community colleges and schools in the area. And there was a lot of controversy, a very good guy, um, CIO named Fred Siff, has helped spend a lot of time on the human issues getting that to work. They're not using it to articulate students up to the UC, uh, but that maybe will happen in time. He's at least created a, a one, one structure. Um, and then, again, from the institutional point of view, if I were sitting at, at the trustee level, I would want to make sure you know, security is a necessity. Um, I would want to get ahead of accountability uh, and make sure that that was covered uh, or I had some way of answering to it because at some point I'm going to have to. And then compliance, as we talked about before. So some of these are more issues of safety now that things have gotten large enough to worry about them. Right? Before, when this stuff was done in the back room and in the black boxes, um, it didn't rise to that level. It, it's risen to that level now. Um, and you'll see the, the risk managers talk about it. So I can only go so far in my understanding of everything about Blackboard because I'm absorbing it all. I certainly have been aware and involved uh, one way or another, either competing against Blackboard or being, being part of it. But this is my own thinking on this. When I look at BASIC and sort of the trajectory that the products have been going on, um, a lot of people started up on BASIC, they experimented with it, they got going on, on e-learning. And the notion, I, we ran into this at Prometheus. Prometheus was the first of the enterprise products. So we tied into the back end, we were able to tie other systems in. Um, I went out on the road and, uh, and talked to um, Xanadu, which is part of ProQuest here in, in uh, Ann Arbor, about could we put their uh, course materials online. By being an enterprise system, we were able to do that. It was one of the first uh, enterprise distributions of publishing materials. So you could build your course pack um, that you would traditionally do at a Xerox machine. Um, you could do it, and then it would express itself through Prometheus. Well, this is where we're going, um, and I'll talk about publishers in a minute. So then th the next level beyond basic was, boy, I need to do this, this, and this. Well, it's going to require customization and, and, and integration to get that done. So the answer to that really was getting to the enterprise system so that systems could tie into each other and that your objectives could be worked out without having to invent things over and over again uh, in the back room. So, uh, so a maturing. And then I, you know, speaking from the outside, had heard about building blocks. And then I heard the open movement starting and all the stuff that was happening. And I never really paid that much attention to building blocks until I came into Blackboard. And I found out that we have about 400 partners, half of whom are, are corporations, some of them small, some of them large. And uh, the other half are institutions that have written something to go inside our system. Now, the question was, and I'm, I'm just being honest here, was this window dressing or was it, was it real? So we hired recently um, one of the people that helped build MIT's open courseware system, where they're giving away their online materials that support the MIT courses. Um, and this fellow has joined our sales um, uh, engineering uh, department, uh, and John Dennett, and he said, people don't understand how good this API system is, that it's the, the most open of systems that go right into a center system. So we're really thrilled with this, and I think you'll hear more from us about the Building Box program, and hopefully we'll see others um, using it in very interesting ways. Content and community system. Um, Two, three years ago, you create in Blackboard, your stuff's landlocked. Um, or you create in WebCT and you want to switch to Blackboard, it's landlocked. The content question, these two C questions came up over and over again um, early on in the, in the field. So now with the content system, we have the ability to put content, uh, varieties of content. And the content system as it exists now in the category of where it will go will grow and improve uh, over time. Same with the community system. Um, uh, the ability to build groups, the ability, if you had, you know, 10 schools to be able to have one community system instance sitting over the top of them, this is the next level and it's about that level of communication. And then with Caliper, we're again moving towards a, another area um, into being able to measure what goes on, be able to report back out, and I think whether we like it or not, that will be a big part of what's going on. So as this becomes generally accepted, at least in this room, then the question is, well, you know, what's, what's new? So 
just a couple things from my rounds out in the world. Uh, again, at Prometheus, uh, I wondered, you know, why don't the textbook publishers have a platform? And last year, or a little, little maybe 18 months ago, there was a study, the CalPRIG study that came out of California, which was a student um, activist group that said, what's the deal with textbook prices? They've been going up at, you know, whatever the multiple is of, of the inflation rate. Um, why is this happening? And so people began to study it, and what they found out was, and this is, I'm sure you all know well, is that the bookstore sells the used book. Well, so the publisher gets one sale. So in order to entice the, um, uh, you know, the faculty into buying the book from the publisher and not the used book, they began to have what's called edition inflation. So more editions more frequently. They also added all sorts of course materials. And you know you needed to get the pin and you knew you needed us to, to be able to activate um, part of the system. So in why, um, if you're developing an online course that you hope will live for three years but the book edition changes a year in, what do you do? So the publishers, as a result of this study that came out, uh, uh, Charles Schumer, the New York senator, and Congress got up and said this is an outrage. The percentage of what students pay in textbooks versus tuition is not fair. So a lot of controversy started. The publisher's answer to this was say, hey, you can have the digital book for half price. Now the digital book, they cooked up during the dot-com time, and nobody liked it. It was a book in HTML, and it was less useful than, than carrying a five-pound book with you. So they made the offer to be able to stand up to the public resistance. Um, but they began to hear what was happening, and they began to look at the numbers in e-learning. And so the publishers now are working uh, to look at what's next for them. And I think you're going to find in the next six months that there's going to be talk about what they're doing digitally. So Pearson, I know, is gearing up in a large way. Thompson and McGraw are looking at it. They used to play at this, the same people that would make the CD-ROMs in, in their individual websites. They've now actually, each one of them, brought on very powerful people. Um, for example, at McGraw, the person that developed Standard & Poor's online uh, is now coming into the central online part of McGraw to figure out what, what the digital text world will look like. Will it be an emulation of a book? Will it be that the content's in a repository and you can populate Blackboard with it as you wish? Um, those are all open questions. What will they charge you for it? How will that work? We're not sure. Um, Michigan Virtual and the virtual school movement came from uh, when, when, if we remember four or five years ago when states actually had surpluses in their treasuries, um, every governor worth uh, his or her salt went out and started a virtual school because they knew that um, e-learning equaled e-politics. You could reach into the barrio in Los Angeles, you could reach into the soccer mom uh, who's, uh, who's on faculty at Stanford. So um, they all started, we have 22 of them now, and an interesting thing happened, there was an organization form called NACOL, N-A-C-O-L dot org, it's the North American Council for Online Learning. That's now headed by Susan Patrick, who worked in the Department of Education, U.S. Department of Education, as the ed tech uh, director. And so we just had a conference of the virtual schools. They're going strong. Um, Florida has the strongest. They serve 50,000 students who, if you decide that you've had it with your algebra teacher, it's a phone call in Florida and you're online with a, with a Florida virtual teacher. Now, 50,000 is a giant number in anybody's e-learning you know, business, but it's not a giant number in terms of all the, all the students in, uh, in Florida. But their models there of where things are going. Um, Illinois has a pretty good virtual school as well. Uh, there are a number of them across the country. So that's an important thing. I mentioned K-20 again. Um, we think that higher education needs to play a role uh, in what happens in high school. Uh, and uh, there we know anybody who's got a senior in high school who's halfway um, smart, you know that they're either goofing off right now um, or just peddling until they go to college. So we need that to go away um, in some way, shape, or form. Uh, legislatures, I mentioned before, we need, to, we need to all carry the word up about what's happening. Um, and then this idea that there could be a state infrastructure. I think at some point, one state or another will begin to take their high-speed networks, which generally don't <coughs> talk to their universities and community colleges, except for bandwidth, uh, and begin to execute policy over them. And that's, there are about half the states have high-speed networks 
none of them um, really coordinate well. Um, Washington has a very interesting thing called the Digital Learning Commons that's gone up and getting more popular. Um, they distri distribute all sorts of things through it. So anyway, um, as you heard from, um, uh, from others, we're growing our solution set. Just a couple things here. Again, this is my learning curve. When I began to see the academic suite and what was contained in it, um, it began to give me a fuller sense of how we're going to handle education at many different levels and we're going to create community um, activity. What I didn't really know about, um, and I think some people in the room have the um, Commerce Suite, uh, is what we're doing on that side. So the students, and I think this campus has it, um, who are using the transaction system and have the ID cards, well, where will that lead us in time? Um, right now, we're not collecting those individual PIN numbers at a, at a global level, but as you hear about identity management, is it possible that we'd pick up a Blackboard student in high school, and I don't know if you've heard this before, but uh, a student that goes to a Blackboard high school generally asks the question at some point, well, gee, when I go to college, do any of those colleges have Blackboard? And so we're hearing this more and more in that students actually identify with our software. And the point was driven home to me, I always carry a Blackboard cap on my, uh, on my briefcase, and I went to a friend's house for dinner who I hadn't seen in a while in Washington, D.C. His son is a sophomore at a school that uses Blackboard. He saw that hat and went crazy and ripped it off my backpack. So we haven't, we haven't really tapped into that, nor have we asked those students to essentially be our ombudsman you know, for you with your administration, for us with our company, for other things. So that's an untapped resource, and essentially the community system sits across uh, the commerce suite and the academic suite, and at some point, as we look at what's going to happen, you know, could we be working with, um, uh, with these end users? Could faculty members, you know, have their own individual accounts that will survive uh, time? So on this slide, I want to just talk about what's going on uh, in, in some of the other activities. So I've been out and talking to Microsoft and, and, uh, and trying to penetrate Google, which is a, is a hard place to get into, and Apple, and the open source movement. Um, there are great things happening at Apple. I mean, anybody who sees the white of the iPod and the, and the, the headphones, uh, they're everywhere. <coughs> and Apple has just set up a uh, iTunes-like store for education purposes. And with the new iPod going out, the, the video one, you know, presumably you can do lectures. So our question was, we have some optimization to do for Apple. Uh, on the Safari browser, we're in the process of looking what it will take to make that work better. We're looking at iPod and saying, hey, what could we do here? So there's nothing on the plan yet, but we're looking at that. That's a phenomena. We should be riding it. Um, Google. Um, Nobody really knows what's going on inside of that company, but every day you hear something new. They now sell a Google box that you can buy for your campus, and it will do very thorough search and so forth. So we're looking at that and saying, hey, is there some way for us to play? What if that box could get inside the course content uh, inside our systems? If, if you could opt into that on a campus, what would that mean? So there are things in search uh, that are interesting. Microsoft, I don't know if you saw our announcement, but for anybody who runs a SharePoint server, uh, we started talking about if you authenticate through a Microsoft product, why can't you be right into Blackboard without having to log in again? So um, we have a project that's underway to look at that issue. We talked about it um, at Educause. Um, textbooks I talked about, um, but again, there's open content. There are the repositories like Merlot. There's a building block we have for Merlot right now. Uh, we're working with the textbook publishers to see what comes after the cartridges, what's, you know, what's the next uh, piece of business. If you want to bring in that content, why should that be any different than, uh, than a faculty member creating some content and putting it in the system? Um, the open content and open source movements, I think, are healthy and they're good things to look at. We um, think with the WebCT merger, it'll actually stimulate more activity on the open source side, which will get us. Uh, uh, working harder to keep up. I think what a presentation like this tells you, though, is that Blackboard is looking at being an academic infrastructure and blending in both administratively and down to the identity level. Um, where Moodle and Sakai uh, and some of the other products play is probably going to be where we were 
with BASIC a while ago. So it may be right that that's a fine area if somebody's getting started, but if you're ending up hanging your infrastructure on this and you have to worry about uh, all the things that I've talked about across the campus, we think that where we're going makes tremendous sense. Open content, though, should be very available. Um, there are things that are going on in terms of adaptive release with our product. Um, we are hopefully setting up an innovations group at some point. We'll look at everybody's talked about games. Nobody has seemed to do anything about it. Um, we want to take a look. Don't know what will happen in that area and talked about identity. Um, and then accountability, again, I can't stress this enough. So performance um, and improvement and reporting that cycle is hopefully something that will help um, uh, innovate and help work with campuses to get that right. Um, and again, we emphasize that Adrian's in the room here who runs our community um, uh, portal. Um, we're going to have a site called Connections uh, that's going to get richer and richer. It's going to be your place to run um, content uh, on the system that you want to share with others. We're going to build up inside of Blackboard. I'm going to work on something called our Blackboard Institute with quotes around it where we'll collect white papers, best practices, uh, and begin to build out the knowledge set. So in a sense, Blackboard 2.0 is taking us from a straight education technology company into being an education company. Um, the technology has to assist where we all need to go. Um, I hope everybody's coming out to Blackboard World. It's in my territory. It's going to be in California and San Diego. We're looking at um, trying to get some interesting speakers. If I had it my way, I would try to get Meathead and Beatty and Arnold down there and let them go at it uh, for everybody's uh, edification, maybe ask them about education. But it should be a good group. I'm putting together a California showcase to show what we're doing across the state. Um, we will have good speakers. It'll be time to, um, to hook up with other people. So those of you who've been there uh, know that. And that's really it. I wanted to say let's innovate together. Um, please feel free to communicate with me on some of these larger issues or if I can help on your campus to get up upstream and talk to more senior people about what you need, I'm happy to do it. Pat knows how to get a hold of me. Uh, and that's what I have to say for today. Thanks. <laughs> Good questions? Good questions? Okay. I'm happy to take questions if it you know, crosses over into a clear product answer, I'm going to call on my colleagues. So. Questions out there? This is a great crowd. You don't get a lot of questions. So, All right, thanks again. And if you have one, just, just track me down. OK, great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, what we're going to uh, we have a, about a half an hour before our, our next uh, breakout session. So I invite you to. Uh, Take any leftovers that you might have. Uh, get a refill, um, and uh, it looks like there's none over there, but there is some over here. Uh, and then, uh, so our next uh, our next time together is the next breakout session, which starts at uh, two o'clock.